yeah, we're we're pleased to have David Baird on today to to present on a couple of pieces. Uh, David works full time with the Scottish FA uh, in a club development capacity. has been has been coaching within the game for sixteen years. I think on our little advertisement it says fifteen, so you must have passed a work anniversary uh, <laughs> recently. Yeah. Um, a licensed coach currently uh, mm -hmm. in Scotland as well, and uh, brought him on to share some of some of the programs that he's both involved with and has developed himself so that we can hopefully steal some pieces here and there uh, to implement in our environments and, and make our environments better at the end of the day. Um, David, on the, on the call here right now, you've got club TDs um, from around Southern Alberta here, um, some coaches from in and around the Calgary area as well. So you've got a, a pretty wide wide range of, of people that I'm sure will bring their experiences and, and bring some good discussion to the table. So David, if I've missed anything, please take it away. No, that that's great. And, you know, thanks for, thanks for having me on, you know, it's been a tough couple of years, uh, but one of the positive things that have maybe came out of, of COVID and the lockdown is being able to network, you, you know, so far afield, um, you know, tuning in from Scotland here and sharing some ideas and, I do a lot of these calls and I must say, Jordan, you've got a really good uh, contingent of coaches on here. There's a really good number of guys that are giving up their time to, to take some ideas from some of the stuff I'm doing here in Scotland. And hopefully you can apply it into your coaching practice. Um, so I'll try and give time for if anyone has any questions, you know, you can come off mute and, and ask me a question. Um, if you have a, an opinion on anything, then hopefully it's very relaxed. I'll probably try and quite concisely go through my short presentation and then we can open it up for uh, discussions at the end. Um, yeah, so I've got 16 years coaching experience. Um, my coaching experience has allowed me to, to, to travel and work in a variety of different countries with different age groups, different clubs. My key passion is probably youth development. Um, I, I kind of know that I'm never going to go and coach Barcelona or Manchester United, but I think my strengths are youth development and hopefully I can share um, some ideas with all my experience. Always think coaching, it's not show, showing the way to do it, it's a way to do it. So I'm going to show one idea in particular that I think is working really well in my experience. Um, and you might be able to take that and add it to all the other things that you have in your armory as coaches and coach educators. You know, will you find the place for some of the stuff I'm going to show you tonight? And if you're not, if you, if you can't, then that's okay. But I'm just going to show a couple of ideas, scoreboard soccer in particular, that I add to my armory of rondos, warm-ups, condition games, game-related practices, technical practices. Uh, I'm just going to hopefully give you a, maybe a new thing that you can throw in to help in regards to youth development. So I'll just share my presentation here. Uh, if you want to interact, you know, I would love anyone who, who wants to come off mute at any point and, and discuss with me. That would be really, really great. So I can get a sense of, of where you guys are and your coaching journey and your opinions. If you want to just interact over the chat function, um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with how you can do that over Zoom. If you happen to be uh, you know, busy and there's other things going on in the house and you want to just sit in the background and listen, then, then that's absolutely fine as well. And given that we're recording it and probably going to share it, that's why I'm probably going to go through it quite concise, just so we have the recording there, um, and then we can uh, ask questions at the end. So I'm, I'm going to discuss um, something that I call scoreboard soccer essentially these are just really fun games that i've done with young kids for a number of years now uh, never really thought anything of it until we went into the covid19 pandemic and lockdown hit and i can't speak for canada and how you guys dealt with the pandemic but here everybody was on lockdown you were in your house and i was going a little bit crazy because i couldn't go out and coach and i couldn't go out and do what i actually wanted to do and so what i did to keep myself sane was I started to share these games that I've used for years over Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Zoom. And they seem to have got a good reception. You know, people saying, you know, what do you call these games? Uh, I didn't have a name for it, so I had to call it Scoreboard Soccer. Uh, I had to come up with a fancy logo, a website that people could access them. Because I've always known that my players, the players that I have worked with, I've found them really good fun, and they've developed. They've became better players. Um, but I never fully appreciated that anyone else would be interested in them. So this is actually a journey I've been on the last couple of years in regards to branding scoreboard soccer, um, but I've probably got six or seven years experience of using 
um, the content that I'm about to I'm about to show you. But I'll take you on my journey. Um, so when I was younger, uh, and I first started coaching, you only know what you see, right? You only know what you're surrounded by. Every coach I ever had was, I'm the coach. You're the players. I talk. You listen. You do this. Listen. And this is the way the game should be played. Uh, and when I first started coaching, I thought it was all about instruction because that is what I was given. It was what I seen. It's still very, very trendy in modern society. When you look at the analysis and you look at the managers and you look at social media and you look at Ted Lasso and you look at Jose Mourinho on Amazon Prime, actually people want to look like a good coach sometimes more than they actually want to be a good coach. Some people want to make it all about them. And that's what I thought coaching was. Now, the first question I'm going to throw to the group, and as I say, I would love anyone that wants to come off mute or enter in the chat. What are the potential downfalls to instruction? What's potentially dangerous about telling people what to do in regards to soccer? Any opinions? James? Yeah, David, two that come to mind is one is it's not, not necessarily fun. And, and number two, who's to say that the instructor uh, actually knows what they've, they're doing? And I've seen this too many times where the instructor doesn't know soccer particularly well, so they're not, they're not teaching the right things. And James, that, that was me. When I look back 15 or 16 years ago and I look at the instruction that I was given and thinking that I was given good instruction, I now get a little bit embarrassed thinking about what I was saying. Back then, I was given wrong information, so that's a potential danger. And then the key one that James has touched on there is it's likely not to be as fun. You know, young players in particular, listening to adults that are authority figures, it's not the most fun thing that they could be doing with their time, standing around and listening to someone, telling them what to do. I don't think anyone really likes being told what to do. So, James, thanks for your contributions. Does anyone have any other potential downfalls of instruction? David, there were a couple of bits in the chat that uh, were sent straight to me. I uh, don't know if the chat function is open for everyone to be sharing. I'm not sure if I click that that piece on. So I'll go into the back end and make sure I sort that out. Um, okay. But all three of them, third one just came in right now, something around it curtails individual development or creativity or uh -huh. stifles that piece. And literally all three are almost exactly the same. Is there anybody whose name you could shout out, Jordan? Because I would love to hear more. Yeah, the, the three, I hope they don't mind them share, uh, me sharing it because uh, they've submitted it anonymously, which the internet allows us to do. But uh, Ryan Parkins, Nigel Brattle, and Kevin Vadiat uh, have all kind of said that same vein of, uh, of, of answer. And Kevin, unfortunately, doesn't have a microphone, he said. So don't call on Kevin. <laughs> and any of the other two, no pressure, but I would love to hear what you mean about stifling creativity. What are we talking about there? But no pressure. Right. Ryan. Cheers, Ryan. Yeah, I was. Uh, what I mean is that we each have our own unique blend, right? If we're built physiologically different. Some have amazing touch and some have amazing speed. We all have a different paintbrush that we paint with. Love it. And so I find that, you know, when you let kids explore their own uh, perspective of what we're trying to give them, then you, you end up seeing things you never thought you'd see or seeing things you never seen before. Yeah, what a fantastic answer. Yeah, you know, we could we could actually give, we could stifle their creativity, just as the three guys have said. We didn't see a Cruyff turn until like 1974, you know? And if we don't give players space to play and be creative and come up with their own ways of doing things, the game is never going to evolve. It's just going to stay stagnant. Um, in some countries where players have autonomy to be creativity, I'm talking about a lot of countries where street football is very prevalent or futsal is very prevalent or small-sided games are very prevalent. We're seeing these fantastically creative young players that are bypassing their coaches because they're getting given the environment to do so. If every player that I worked with took everything that I said as gospel, they would only ever grow up to be as good at soccer as I am. And I wouldn't wish that on any of the young players I work with. You know, I want them to be better than me. And Cruyff has a beautiful quote on the Cruyff turn. He was asked, you know, how often did you practice that skill before you took it into a game? And he said, it wasn't a skill, it was a solution. You know, I'm playing a game of football. There's a defender, there's a space, there's my teammate. And this was a solution. 
So actually, sometimes it's not about us showing young players how the game should be played. Sometimes they can show us how the game could be played. You know, there's different ways of doing things. If we are so set on the way the game should be played, every session we're probably doing passing with inside of your foot. But I've seen Ronaldinho pass the ball with his back once. You know, I've seen the ball come to him from a, a goal kick and he turned around and he backed it to the other player. Now, no way did the coach on Thursday morning say, right, guys, come on in. We're going to do a little session on passing the ball with your back today. You know, that comes through freedom and creativity. And these are the players that people pay money to come and watch. And that money filters down into youth academies and it creates jobs. And, you know, we could really go on a, a tangent on what these creative young players bring to the game. I love the fact, and Ryan will probably revisit this, that everyone's painting with a different brush. I've not heard it expressed that way before, but I really, really like that. And, and it's very relevant to something we're going to come on to. So our information could be wrong. It might take away a lot of fun and it might stifle some creativity of our young players if we over instruct. Was there anything else, guys, before we move on? Nothing else sent in to me other than uh, someone's plugged in their headphones. So I hope it hope it works. That's it. Great stuff. Now they just need to understand that the accent and they're they're good to go. Um. So yeah, I mean, I could throw a couple of other ones. I was very very instruction based as a coach, and I don't think it was very fun. Not just for the players, but also for me because sometimes I wasn't just given instruction that was wrong, but I was actually given instruction that was right but pit strong. You know, the players were too young to understand it or they weren't capable of achieving what I was asking them to achieve. So actually, I wasn't having fun either. The players were finding it tough. It was too hard. The information was wrong. They couldn't do what I was asking them to do. And I wasn't really enjoying coaching. And coaching should probably be just as fun for us as it should be for the players. I might have been stifling creativity. Um, you know, we get instruction like, okay, everyone has to play two-touch. Well, I could have had Ronaldinho in my session and I wouldn't have known because everyone has to play two-touch. And there's zero development there of a very crucial skill, the zero development there of decision-making because I've made the decision for every single player every single time they get the ball. Sometimes you have to take six touches, sometimes you have to take one, sometimes you have to take seven. And the, the, the players, they all learn differently. So this is where my journey took me next. So I'm an instruction-based coach. I'm not really enjoying coaching and I don't think my players are really enjoying working with me and then the best thing that ever happened to me was my day job taught me loads about people not so much about coaching it taught me about people and how people learn so I'm sure this is prevalent in Canada as well I'm working a day job 9 a.m to 5 p.m every single day and then I'm coaching at 6 p.m so I'm running through traffic I'm trying to get my sports coaching gear on I'm trying to get something to eat I'm trying to get set up trying to plan my session and then play. But the best thing that happened to me was my day job was all about working with people and how you get them to change their behavior. It was all in behavior change. And I started to think, can I take some of this into my coaching? Because I'm getting all these barriers of instruction. So my, my day job, guys, was people had some motivation around trying to change a positive or a negative behavior. So positive behaviors, for example, they wanted to improve their diet or go to the gym more or you know whatever reconnect with family members that they've lost touch with negative behaviors they wanted to stop smoking uh improve their diet eat less stop drinking stop taking drugs stop gambling and it was all about changing behaviors and one of the first things i learned in that job was instruction doesn't work because actually it's human nature to be defensive if I have a one-to-one -one consultation with Jordan and Jordan wants to stop smoking and I just instruct him for an hour, he probably has a justification for why he does that behavior that he does. And he probably doesn't like being told that he's wrong. If I say to Jordan, Jordan, you should stop smoking because it's bad for your health. It increases your risk of heart disease. You can harm others through passive smoking. You'll be unhealthy. It costs a lot of money. Jordan will probably say, but I've done it for years. All my friends do it. It helps my social life and it helps my anxiety. They're, they're not listening to people in a position of education. They're actually just wanting to justify their own beliefs. And, and sometimes young players can be the exact same. 
oh, you, you need to strike the ball with your laces. Oh, I've scored 10 goals with my big toe coach. You know, they're not in the mindset of long-term development and they're not thinking about the whole team and they're just there to play and have fun. And if you do anything that takes away the fun, they might internally or externally question that. They might not be bad kids that talk back to you, but subconsciously they might be thinking, oh, I don't understand that. I don't like that. You know, why can't I do that? It's human nature to be defensive. And one of the key things that I found in my day job, when they said, when you want to change someone's behavior, the best thing you can do is build the environment for the behavior that you want. And I thought that that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to take into my coaching. So in Scotland, we were actually world leaders on that particular um, subject of smoking. We told people to stop smoking for years and they still done it because it's human nature to be defensive. So what did we do? We changed the environment. We were the first country in the world to make it illegal to smoke in bars and restaurants, indoors and offices. We made it illegal to advertise on cigarettes and we made it illegal to display cigarettes in supermarkets and malls. We made the behavior harder through the environment that we live in and the smoking rates dropped and then the world followed us. So my coaching totally changed from instruction to the environment. What is the behavior I want? And then how do I build the environment um, to get that? So hopefully you guys are, are, are with me. And then I started applying what I was doing in my day job and my coaching and my coaching and my opinion. I was having so much more fun. The kids were getting more touches. There was more freedom of decision making. I wasn't stifling creativity. I wasn't giving them wrong information. I was seeing smiles and success and fun. I was enjoying it. The players were improving. And then, and I don't know if there's a direct correlation, but six months later, I was in full-time employment and youth development, you know, and I've, I've now been working full-time in football for the, the past uh, six or seven years or so. Um, so I'm just trying, I just want to share that with you. Know the behaviours you want and uh, create the environment. Now, I could give you some examples before we come on to, to scoreboard soccer. Um, so here's one. Uh, you're, you've got a group of kids and a young boy is just much better than everybody else. He, he's maybe just been playing football longer. He maybe has a, an older brother or sister that he plays in the backyard with. He, he, he maybe started playing when he was, was younger. So he can dribble by everybody in school. He can uh, win the ball back anytime he wants. Um, he's just way better than everybody else. So the, the behavior you probably want is him to share the ball a little bit more and everyone else to develop. Does anyone have any ideas of what you can do in that situation? Or I can reword the question. What do you think I would have done 16 years ago if I had a kid who was dominating the ball? What instruction would I have gave? Yeah, David, it's James. Move it, move James. it. Sorry, James. Oh, yeah. yeah James. I, was just, I was going to say you probably told him to pass the ball. Uh, yeah, I probably, yeah, I probably instructed that young player to pass or instructed that young player to take two touches or instructed that young player you need to pass before the team can score. And James, who's that not fair on? Well, it's not fair on anyone, to be honest with you, but mostly not fair on the advanced player. It's not fair on the young player. And I love Ryan's quote, they're all painting with a different brush. Here's a young player that, it could be the next Maradona, Pele, Ronaldo, Neymar, Messi. And actually, if I tell him he has to play two touches, and there's a kid who's similar in Barcelona who doesn't get told he has to play two touches, I've probably stifled all that creativity, all that talent through through one instruction. You have to play two touch. Now, actually, I think as a coach, if you have a young player who can dribble by three or four players, your job is to get them to dribble by five or six. You know, it's not to make them worse, it's to make them better. And I've been doing this for 16 years. I can, I can tell you from experience, the young player who can dribble by five, six or seven players, when they're 15 or 16, you can get them to pass the ball a little bit more. The players who always pass, when they're 15, 16, you can't get them to dribble by five or six players. So I've gone on a wee bit of a tangent here, but I'm, I love creative players and I love dribblers. And a big part of today is not to not to take them out of the game. We need to encourage uh, creative, um, creative players. I do a lot of coach education. I help a lot of volunteer coaches. 
and I see a lot of people shout pass, pass, pass at the side of a soccer field. I don't see a lot of people shout dribble, dribble, dribble. <laughs> you know, you've got one kid that doesn't pass, but 15 kids that don't dribble. Pick your battles, because when you make them all technically proficient, you can get some real good pass and moving going in three or four years' time. Anyway, where was I? 15 years ago, instruction-based David Baird, I'm saying to that kid, you need to pass the ball or you need to play two touches. Let me give you an example of an environment that I create. So I know the behavior I want. I want this kid to move the ball a wee bit more. Now I need to create the environment that they do it subconsciously or they do it automatically. Right, guys, 4v4, you know, nine-year-old boys, 4v4, small pitch, massive goals, 11-a-side goals, 4v4, um, no goalkeepers. 4v4, small pitch, big goals, no goalkeepers. When you score a goal, you become the goalkeeper. The next player to score a goal, they become the goalkeeper. And it's the first team to get all of their players in goals wins. So you want to get all four of your players in goals wins. First time we play that game, little Jimmy, the fantastic player, gets a ball, dribbles by everybody, scores. What's Jimmy now doing for the next five minutes of that game? He's standing in goals, right? He's standing in goals for the next five minutes. We play the game again. What does Jimmy do next time? Any opinions? Try to not score. <laughs> but how does he win the game? By passing the ball to someone else to score. <laughs> yeah. So he doesn't he, he doesn't have to I've not told him to pass. And he doesn't have to take two touches, but what he can do, he can use his fantastic paintbrush as Ryan said. He can use his fantastic skills to manipulate the ball, create some space, and try and put it on a plate for Ryan to score. And then Ryan jumps in goals. Then he can get the ball again and he can use his foot skills and he can try and get Randy to score and Randy's in goals. Then he can use his fantastic foot skills to get Jordan to score and then he can try and score the winner. But when he sets up his three teammates, now he's one against three, and which is maybe the challenge that he actually needs. And the three players, that's the support that they actually need. So that's just one example of, right, here's the behavior. Let's create the environment so they do it uh, subconsciously. And that's a really good fun one. It's called Goal to Goal. Um, and, and that's just to give you an idea of how I session plan. What do I want to see? Design the environment. And other industries have been doing it for years. There's a reason Walmart put all the milk up the back of the store. They want you to walk by loads of stuff that you don't need on your way to get the milk. You know, there's a reason that if you guys come to Scotland, and you do a tour of a whiskey distillery, you'll finish that tour in a gift shop surrounded by whiskey with a 50% off whiskey voucher in your hand. All around us, people are designing the environments for the behaviours they want to see, and those behaviours come habit. You know, if anybody on the call here drives, you're probably not really thinking about staying within the white lines and speeding up when it's an amber light, but slowing down when it's an amber and green light because it's about to turn red you're probably just automatically doing loads of things because of the environment that's created. When, when I do this um, presentation in person, in a presentation room, all the coaches walk in, they sit down and they look at the screen. And I say to them, who told you to do that? Well, nobody had to because all the chairs were in a line facing the projector screen. And I wanted you to come in and sit down. So the environment is designed for the behaviours. So anyway, that's a little bit of insight into my coaching. I know the behavior, communication, spreading out, passing and moving, dribbling, going in for rebounds, and I create loads of wee environments and fun games. Um, so if we come back onto the presentation now, guys, um, I know I've still got that up on the screen there. Here's a coach that's trying to get all these players to jump up and down. How realistically can you keep them motivated in an instruction-based approach? You know, come on, jump high, bend your knees, who can jump the highest? How much fun can you make that? But what you could do instead of instructing young players to jump is you could bring the instruction down and you could build the environment up, you know, and you'll get kids jumping, kids being competitive, who can jump the highest, kids being creative, front flips, back flips, kids banging into each other and having to get back up. You'll get resilience, you'll get character building. 
And then the main thing that I hope you would get is they don't want to come off. And I think that's the best gauge of a young player session. They don't want to leave or they're desperate to come back the next session. Can we create an environment where it, no matter what we're working on, our young players are, are desperate um, to come back? So that's that's what I'm all about, environment-based coaching. I'm going to share one environment today, which is called scoreboard soccer. So as my coaching developed and environment-based coaching was working really, really well, instead of getting the behaviour first and then designing the environment, I started to think, can I create an environment that can work for any behavior? And that will make a little bit more sense soon. So this is scoreboard soccer, guys. Um, we have 12 players that show up to the session. For example, we want loads of touches, loads of involvement, loads of opportunities to develop. So we split them into four teams of three and we say, right, go and play. But then you get little Jimmy on the ball who can dribble by everybody and score. Now, I want Jimmy to know that that's a really, really good behavior. I love the fact that he's got the ball dribbled by everybody and scored a goal. But I've got a duty of development to all the other players. So what I'll do is I'll say, Jimmy, fantastic goal. Come and put a point on the scoreboard. And Jimmy will run over and he'll put a ball on the scoreboard. He knows that he's did something really good, but he might not recognise that we're just momentarily getting Jimmy off the pitch so the ball can be shared. That player who dominates gets a big well done, an opportunity to visually score, uh, visually show they've scored a goal. Uh, and it's the first team uh, to fill their, the, their four cones. This game's called Connect Four. And it's a really good environment to keep young players, regardless of their current ability or their age or their stage, all working hard. Because you might be getting uh, really heavily overran here, but actually you just need the next goal because your team over here are doing really well. Or you might be dominating here on the pitch, but you can't slow down because, you know, the Reds have got three and you need to get the next one. So that's scoreboard soccer. It's adding an uh, external scoreboard to keep the score of your small-sided games. But what we do now, and this can be a full session because you can rotate the teams, you can mix up the players. We ask the young players, is goal scoring the only good thing we can do on a soccer field? No. Well, what else can we do? And they'll tell you communication, spreading out, passing, moving, dribbling, scoring goals, running in for rebounds, running back to try and tackle and, and help your team. And I just say, okay, if I see any of these behaviours and I feel as if they deserve praise, then you'll get sent to the scoreboard. So now it becomes a really, really individualised scoreboard. And I keep coming back to Ryan's great point around they're all different different uh, paintbrushes. So if Jordan's been here for five years, when he dribbles by everybody in schools, right, Jordan, that was good to come over. If Ryan's here for the very first time and he's never played soccer before, he might just touch the ball. He might just try and get involved. And I say, right, well done, Ryan, come over. If I've been working on James to dribble a little bit more, James, I love that you tried to dribble. Come to the scoreboard. He's now motivated to repeat those behaviours. But maybe I have been working on Sarah to pass the ball a little bit more. Well done, Sarah. Come and get a point on your scoreboard. So now you have a small-sided game of football, but it's individual development. It's a very individualised programme. And it just keeps it competitive because young people and, and people that are involved in football in general are competitive. So there is winning and losing. But I can define what winning looks like as the coach. And for me, as a young player, winning looks like trying really hard you know, sportsmanship, teamwork, communication. I can tell you from exact from experience, when Sarah communicates and I say, Sarah, great communication, come to the scoreboard, where your young players are starting to communicate in, in quite a short space of time, you can build a culture with all these values and beha behaviours that, that you want to see as a coach. A fun progression to scoreboard uh, Connect 4. You can put a ball on your team's cone uh, or you can run over and kick a ball off uh, the other team's going. And I've got some great, you know, pictures and footage of, of young players playing this game. And and if you give it a try, I'd love to see, uh, I'd love to see um, it from your guys' point of view as well. Uh, any questions on scoreboard soccer before we, we move on? I know there might be some at the end. No? 
no worries if you do guys just just store them for the end and that's absolutely fine Jordan did you have a question yeah I just had a quick one for you just trying to dig a little deeper so you talked about reinforcing that behavior that you really wanted to see or maybe what you've been working on with that individual player at what point do you kind of draw that line so Sarah's communication is excellent in that moment cool come over to the scoreboard as soon as she joins the pitch again communication is great again is that another instant reward or how do you kind of say, hey, you know what, cool, this is great. Now your next challenge maybe is this in order to score a point for communication, say. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And um, there's a couple of downfalls to scoreboard soccer, so poorer practice that I've seen. Uh, and I'll just go over them just now. Your scoreboard has to be appetizing. It has to be a reward. I've seen people take this concept and the scoreboard has been ladders, hurdles, and, and they don't want to get sent there. Or the scoreboard's been you know, 20 yards away from the pitch. It's going quickly, register your point and quickly get back on because they enjoy playing the game. The other downfall that I've seen is I spray the ball out wide to Tony. I'm running into the box to get the ball back, but the coach has sent me to the scoreboard. You need to know when to praise, you know, natural kind of moments that you can see, right, David, come on over uh, and then quickly get back on. And then the other one is, I think this is what you're talking about, Jordan, it needs to be justifies praise. You know, if you're just praising everything, then the kids are going to realize that it doesn't actually value much. You know, um, it, it needs to be, there needs to be a balance. Now, you might have a player who you know in their home life or in their school life is having a tough time through bullying or their lack of confidence or they've just came back from an injury. You might praise them a little, a little bit more. Um, but what I would say is when you try it, um, I think that will answer your, your question, Jordan. I think you'll see, like, oh, yeah, I praise Sarah for communicating, and now she's kind of keeping that going. Oh, she's not done it for a couple of minutes, so the next time she does it, I might reinforce that habit. And you guys will get quite good at finding the balance of justified praise, but not over-praising. It's a really, really good question. So the David, scoreboards, one, guys... And, can I ask you one more? Because I noticed Coach is yeah. in the middle of two games there. Uh, any suggestions that you have on managing those two games at the same time? Because that is a difficult skill for coaches. It's easy to put a, you know, you've got a 6v6 there essentially, right? To put one game on and to say, this is easy to manage. It looks a bit cleaner. It's not as chaotic and messy. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you manage both of those games at the same time? Or do you have any tips to do that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great because as a coach, and, and there's a place for 6v6, that's going to be in your curriculum somewhere. But as a coach, I know that 3v3 is better for development. It's better for football fitness, touches, involvements. And, and see, see, because I'm all about individual development, because I work with Scottish FA and I don't coach a team, I'm never thinking about the team. I'm always thinking about the player. And I try and keep them small-sided for as long as possible. Because actually, when you watch the live-in-a-side game, it's all just 3v3s and 4v4s and 2v2s all over the pitch anyway. So I'm all about, okay, I know 6v6 would be more manageable, but to do what's right for my players, I want to get a 3v3. And then your point's a really good one, Jordan, because see if I play 3v3 without the scoreboard, that's when, when I'm looking here, there's two kids over there that are fighting or misbehaving or not listening or not trying, you know? And then when I turn to look at them, there's one over here that's doing cartwheels or looking at the airplanes in the sky, you know? And actually what you're describing are barriers that I experienced without the scoreboard, but being able to put a scoreboard in the middle and have two pitches running because, of, because you win the game through positive behaviors, it keeps engagement in check and it keeps behavior in check. And actually the games run themselves, you know, to answer your question. So I'm showing, I'm showing two pitches here but I've had eight pitches running and a scoreboard in the middle and pitches all around me, you know? And some of the programs I run when you've got hundred kids there and you've got a couple of volunteer, you know, younger uh, players that are helping you with it. I couldn't do it without the scoreboard. You know, it allows me to stand in the middle, watch and look for good behaviors. And what you can do as well is you can call out and you can nip in the bud to poor behavior. You know, someone that uses the wrong language or they're not sports. We don't do that here. Come and take a point off your scoreboard. So I, I totally understand the question, but I actually think those things are more difficult without the scoreboard to keep them in check. Because what you might get as well, 6v6, 
good players will dominate, experienced players, the players who are, who, are, who are good will dominate. But you might actually get a lot of bad habits because I'll just let you dribble by me and score because I'm going to get the ball in a minute anyway, you know? Uh, James, did you have a question? Yeah, you, you might get there, but I, I thought I could ask you now. But just yeah. it, love this concept. Uh, with young kids, and I, keep, I coach uh, nine and 10 year olds. Yeah. Um, what are the ways you give points to reward defensive behaviors that you want to see? Yeah, particularly, um, so this is probably not going to be a full session, James, right? So if you do a little defending exercise and you go into scoreboard soccer and you say, guys, what, what did we work on? Or tracking back or not diving in or you know defending 1v1, 2v2. Okay, so what do you think I'm going to praise in the game? And then they'll say it again and you, you get them to realise, yeah, you know, okay, I'm not going to, another common mistake of scoreboard soccer, I'm not going to have predetermined ideals of what I'm going to praise. I'm not going to say, guys, um, scoreboard soccer, and today I'm going to praise through balls. And then all your players are just doing through balls when it wasn't the right time. Another team noted that we might give the, you know, really want you to be tracking back. And like I say, James, the second you say, oh, Ryan, well done for you know running back and helping your team come to the scoreboard, other players can get can get motivated uh, to do that. But I think the next section is really going to help you on that one, James, because if you guys go on scoreboardsoccer.com, there's games of putting balls on top of cones, finding things that are hidden underneath cones, flipping water bottles for them to, to, to land the right way up. There's games that are crazy and fun, and all they're doing is engaging your 8, 9, and 10-year-olds to work hard on the soccer pitch, but then there's games that involve some training, uh, and I've I've got a defending scoreboard, so your scoreboard can be some individual technical practices as well. Because if Jordan's ripping it up on the pitch, okay, I want him to come off, but I maybe want him to work on something and keep him developing. So let me give you um, this scoreboard soccer game is called Maze. We've got three v threes. I'm actually comfortable enough to jump in and play because the game's managed on themselves enough. We've got orange teams on two pitches. We've got yellow teams on two pitches. The orange team have their scoreboard here with five footballs. The yellow team have their scoreboard there with five your team is a player down so you need to quickly perform skill and then you need to quickly get back on the key thing to scoreboard soccer is you're manipulating the, the picture on the pitch because football is interchangeable all the time one minute on the pitch here it's going to be 3v3 then two against three then 3v1 then 1v1 and um, so you can get some some individual practice at the scoreboard uh, as well so we've got ones that involve technical, technical things. These players are a little bit younger, a little bit less developed. This game's called Beanstalk, orange against blue, and you're trying to get the biggest beanstalk. So when you come over, you take a cone, you dribble through the beanstalk, you <coughs> add a layer, and then you get back on, you know? And the, the, the young players get really excited at the end of the five-minute game, eight-minute game. They, they come over, they count their, their cones and they, and they see who gets the most. Um, and this is where, again, it can become quite individualised because one of the scoreboards I do is, you know, beat the goalie. It's, it's shooting. It's shooting practice. So when Nigel comes off the pitch, who's my player who's dominating on the pitch, like he's absolutely ripping it up, as he runs by me to do the shooting drill, I'll say, Nigel, you keep shooting until you miss. So if you were to watch my session from above, you have loads of small-sided games, which I think we hopefully all agree are great. But one of my talented players is doing a bit of shooting. And then when he misses, he jumps back on the pitch. But then when Kevin comes over, who's not getting a lot of touches in the pitch, Kevin, you keep shooting until you score. You see how you can individualise it as well. Um, another thing you can do to manipulate the environment Let's say it's 3v3 and David is my star player. I can bring him to the scoreboard to challenge him, but I can leave him on the pitch to challenge him as well. I can intentionally send his two teammates to the scoreboard, you know? 
I can say, well done, David. Well done, Sarah. Come to the scoreboard and leave that player one against three. That's the challenge that player might need. So you can manipulate the pitch for what you're wanting to achieve. Guys, I think it's a good time to take a breath and see if there's any other feedback or questions or, or anything I've maybe not explained well enough. Any thoughts? Okay. Great. Okay, um, so for me, scoreboard soccer, it works on two, two layers. I wish I could take it to 17-year-old David Baird when he first started coaching and said, right now, the game is a better coach than you are. And you need to be humble and you need to swallow your pride and swallow your ego and understand that scoreboard soccer is going to put on better sessions than you are. Because of all the instruction things that we spoke about earlier, all the downfalls of instruction and my lack of knowledge, so if I'm a volunteer mum or dad who's only helping out because my son or daughter's in the team, small-sided games and keeping behaviour and engagement in check through a scoreboard is probably a decent session until I build some experience, try a couple of things, watch other coaches and go on the appropriate qualifications. Letting them play and catching them doing good is probably a, a decent session, you know. Praising uh, Jeff for this and Robert for this and Sarah for this and playing the game at an individual level. That's the baseline of scoreboard soccer. But then I use it now as someone who works with some pretty good programs here, some, some pretty high performing players. I've been coaching for 16 years. I've got my UEFA uh, Youth A license and my UEFA A license. It gives you a great opportunity to coach. Your volunteer brand new coaches don't need to know this, but you're not really taking David to the scoreboard. You're momentarily taking David out of, posi out of position. So how do you navigate 4v3 counter-attacking, attacking overloads? How do you defend outnumbered? How do the three slow down the four for David to get back? Now remember, if you think about the first couple of slides, the environment is the coach, not me. You know, I don't think about myself as a coach. I think about myself as an architect of learning. I've designed something that my players are going to learn within. So if 4v4, scoreboard soccer, player gets sent to the scoreboard, four against three, and the group of four, they all bomb forward and they lose the ball, and the group of three pass it to the player who's just coming back and score, there's the problem, go and solve it. I'm not stepping in to coach that. That's why we're doing it to give them that problem and let them try and work it out, let them problem solve it. Now, if it happens again, and then it happens again, and then the next time, instead of all four going forward, one of them provides a little bit of balance, checks the shoulder and watches the player come back from the scoreboard, communicates in front of them, and they problem solve it. In my opinion, guys, I'm the best coach in the world, and I've not said anything. That What I've designed has taught the lesson for me. Now, if they do it five times in a row, I'm probably identifying that, okay, they have a gap in their knowledge here and I need to go in and coach. Okay, guys, hold on, what, what's happening? Oh, well, they just pass it to David at the scoreboard and he keeps scoring. Right, so what might you do next time? Oh, well, I guess one of us could step back and, and be mindful of David and the other three could attack. And if we can't go down the right, they can cut it back to me and I can shoot or I can switch it to the left. You know, that kind of boost gets kind of role. Great, you know, go and, go and try that. So it gives you a great opportunity to coach within it and paint some really good pictures. I see it all the time, the group of three defending the four and they don't even realise that they play a down. They always just jump in, they get played around one at a time and the group of four score. See if they problem solve it. And then if they don't, guys, what's happening? Oh, well, Rebecca's at the scoreboard, so we only have three players. Okay, so what might you do next time? Well, I guess we could get narrow, compact, defend the goal and try and slow down the attack until Rebecca can come back. And you might want to move them around and paint those pictures, talk about them getting side on, delaying the attack, and you might want to coach within scoreboard soccer. So yes, it's fun and it's individual development and it's catching them doing good. It's calling out the good stuff that amazing young players can do. Sometimes the default setting for coaches is, what are my players doing wrong? What's bad? What do I need to correct? What do I need to fix? When actually there's a place for catching them doing good. 
I've said it before, if Messi grew up in Scotland, we would only focus on kicking with his right foot and defending. That's it. We wouldn't work on anything else because sometimes we only focus on the negatives as coaches. So let them play, catch them doing good. But if you have some coaching knowledge to impart, what an opportunity it gives you to do that. So on the screen here, this is what we are exposing the players to constantly. Uh, and this is a clip from Champions League a couple of years ago. So it's, in my opinion, it's really relevant. Um, if you just play 3v3, the picture might not change too much. But if you play 3v3 with a scoreboard, you're going to have to scan and react to the to the ever-changing picture of, of football. Um, and this is really important. Uh, coach what you see. So again, I don't come in with predetermined ideals. Oh, David did. Instruction-based David did. Okay, I've got 10 players and I'm going to teach them all to pass on the inside of the foot. That's the theme today. But actually, five of them are great at passing on the inside of their foot. Three of them are not ready to work on that. And two of them don't know where the inside of the foot is. I think that's quite an old way of coaching. You know, this kind of designing one theme for 15 kids. So I try and get loads of game activity. I let them play. And if I can see that they're over committing when they're overloads, or they're diving in when they're outnumbered, or they're not creating enough width to create passing lanes, then if you have that knowledge, you can you can go in and you can coach what you see. The main thing I'm looking for, guys, and we're coming towards the, the end of the presentation here, but this is probably my biggest tip for anyone that's working with young players, and you do use scoreboard soccer or anything, really, try and praise the process, not the outcome. Focus on effort, not outcomes. So what I mean by that is when I'm doing scoreboard soccer, it might just be me personally, I genuinely don't care if the ball hits the back of the net, if they win the tackle or if they complete the pass. I'm looking for players that, you know, if Ryan shoots, doesn't matter if he misses. Ryan, I love that. Uh, or he, he tracks back to make the tackle, but he misses the tackle. I love that you're tracking back because then they'll keep shooting. They'll keep chasing back. They'll keep being brave to get on the ball and the outcomes will improve. So I always praise effort, not outcomes, because it also... This is what I've seen a lot of in my 16 years. If you focus on negative outcomes, the players are demoralized, they're never going to improve. But if you always focus on positive outcomes, those players get so complacent. If you keep talking about the kid who always scores, the kid who completes all the passes, the kid who dribbles by everybody and wins all the tackles, <clears throat> you think they're the best player in the world and they get really complacent because you're only highlighting their positive outcomes. Keep praising their effort as well. So regardless of how good they are, they keep improving. Because what I realised when I removed myself and I travelled around the world, the kid that I thought was the best player in the world really isn't. They, they, they can all keep working. Um, so that's just me, guys. Effort, not outcomes. I don't know about Canada, but, but we have a really unhealthy culture here where a lot of adults, particularly parents, are obsessed with outcomes. Obsessed. I, I, I say to the volunteers... Coaching 12-year-olds, how was your game at the weekend? I uh, we won 5-0. It's not what I asked. You know, you're not going to remember that score in 10 years' time. Are they doing the things you're working on? Are they working hard? Are they enjoying their football? Are they getting equal game time? Are you rotating positions? These are all the things that are going to make them better players. If I bring my daughter to your programme in Canada, I don't care if you win 7-0. I want you to make her a really good footballer. Does that make sense, guys? Um so I, I can, as a coach, I can work with young players and I can do scoreboard soccer and I can let them understand that I don't care how good or how bad you are, effort is what it's all about. We have a culture of effort. And then they jump in the, the car and mum or dad ask them two outcome-based questions that destroys all of my hard work. Did you win? No. Did you score? No. And that young player who's actually worked really, really hard now thinks they didn't have a good day. We need to understand individual development. The team can win, but you can lose. No touches of the ball. You didn't have fun. You didn't work on skills from training. Listen, the team can lose, but you can win. If you worked really, really hard, got touches, our young players need to know this. And the parents of your programs as well, they probably need to know this as well. Um, effort, not outcome. 
Okay, we're coming into the end of the slides. Um, so please just hold any questions or thoughts. I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on effort over outcome and coaching overloads and underloads and, and using the scoreboard to manipulate environments. Hopefully you've got a wee bit of feedback for me. But the last thing that I'm going to touch on is, is their game. We are just there to facilitate it. You know, can we let them pick the teams and mix up the teams and you go Brazil and we'll go France and if you give them a wee bit of involvement, not just in scoreboard soccer, but in anything, um, that's how you you really win over young players. We, we call it autonomy. Autonomy is, is is crucial. And I guess what I'm trying to say in this section here is all the best scoreboards have been designed by players. They've all been designed by kids. You know, kids coming along and bringing their favourite board games, you know, snakes and ladders. So this is the one where I've had 10 pitches going, you know, and there's a red counter and a blue counter and a green counter and there's a wee car and there's a wee dog and they come and they roll the dice and they, they move up it. If they've designed the scoreboard, they're, worked, they're, they're so motivated to try and be sent there, you know? It's like the World Cup final on the pitch because they want to come and roll a dice. Um, my last clip, and it never does it justice because you, you don't know the, the girls, but this was a group where the coach said, okay, Scottish Football Association, English Football Association, United Soccer Coaches, everyone is telling us games-based approach, small-sided games. That's the directive. But when I try and get these girls to play 4v4 or 5v5, not interested. You know, they just talk and they cartwheel and, you know, kids being kids. And I, I told them about scoreboard soccer and this was the first time they tried it and the coach said the engagement was just amazing. These were girls that you just couldn't engage in soccer. And okay, the quality is not great, but they're trying. Um, and with time, that's going to get better. They designed the scoreboard. Um, they designed the scoreboard, which was the egg and spoon race. So they come over, they get a ball, they have an egg on the spoon. If they drop it, they don't get the point. They dribble the ball into their team's scoreboard, and then they get back on the pitch. And again, the quality is not great, but they're trying to get on the ball. They're trying to spread out because the coach is praising that. They're trying to communicate. They're, they're engaging in the sport that the week before they, they weren't. And at the scoreboard, there's a wee bit of small touches, balance, head up. Um, but it's not about that. It's just about having fun um, and then coming over and counting who got the most footballs in their scoreboard. When all the balls are gone from the middle area, the girls can then steal a ball uh, from the other team scoreboard and, and, and take it over. So guys, hopefully I've kind of painted a picture of what scoreboard is. It's understanding if you just play small-sided games, uh, you might not cater for mixed ability levels. You may um, have some disengagement. <clears throat> there might be a focus on winning over effort and development and trying to get, you know, just become better individual players. Whereas if you add that external challenge, you, you know, you can you can take away some of those barriers and just be just just give the kids a bit of fun. Let them play, catch them doing good. I really hope you'll go on a journey now where you'll check out scoreboardsoccer.com, use some of the scoreboards that I, that I know work quite well. Um, but then you'll design your own scoreboards and you'll email me at the bottom there and, and tell me so I can steal them back and I can try some of your ideas for scoreboards. But then see when you start to get the kids designing scoreboards, that's when the fun really starts. We've had water balloon fights. We've had pogo sticks being brought along to soccer practice and jumping. We've had skipping ropes. We've had games of hangman where you need to try and dress mannequins. Um, we've had so much fun with kids designing their own scoreboard. Uh, scoreboard soccer is still on this journey where there's now the scoreboard soccer book, which not only shows you the games, but you know full session plans that you can hide the games within. Uh, I've spoke about the website and, and there's a few other things going on as well, which are, are, are quite exciting. So guys, thank you so much for your time. Before we maybe open it out to anything else that you want to ask about, any thoughts, feedback, or questions on scoreboard soccer? Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to just say something. Um, Can I um, you know, I'm uh, I'm a senior senior coach. I'm 69, and uh, for me, uh, this this has gone. Life goes full circle here because when I was when I was nine and ten, nobody coached us. We just played. The yeah. game was the teacher, and we watched the game. So I think it's it's an interesting concept, and particularly when you you know, let them play the game, but you create game situations by, say, having a four versus three 
an overload, uh, defending with one player less. Uh, it's an opportunity to teach them the the uh, the coaching points, but in a game situation, which is really where they learn the game, is playing the game. It's a, I'm really glad you've said that, Nigel, because it's a big bit of my motivation. When I was younger, I loved street football. I loved playing with my friends. We picked the teams. There was seven of us. We'd play four against three. We'd play all day. I could take as many touches as I wanted. We could joke. We could laugh. And I, I became a much better footballer through street football. When I went along to organised soccer, it was stand behind the cone, run around the pitch, and when we finally got to touch the ball, we could only take two touches. So I'm really glad that this game become the teacher is coming back in. Um, and, and that's all this is. The, the main part of it is we're just letting them play football. But with the modern day kids, particularly with the distractions of social media, Netflix, YouTube, smartphones, sometimes they just need that wee bit of gamification, that wee bit of fun at the side. So they work hard within the game. But the, it's a great point, Nigel. The game's an important bit. We just want them playing football, right? Yeah, the, the, the parts, you know, with the scoreboard on the side... Uh, just makes it a little bit more interesting for them too and motivates yep. them, right? So it's it's cool. Yep, that's, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Thanks for that, Nigel. Um, anyone else, guys? Uh, Ryan here, if you've got, unless someone else has got their hand up. Um, I, I just want to say that, uh, like, I appreciate the methodology here because I feel like so many of us as coaches, depending on, you know, I got into coaching quite young because I had kids quite young. I loved the game, played my whole life, yada, yada, yada. But we all kind of went on a, a similar journey. You know, we we emulated what our coaches taught us. We took that to the field and then we've evolved, you know, and you evolve day to day. You, I, I think one of the best quotes I heard, and I, I think it might have actually been Coach Herdman, was that we're, we'd be like a sponge. The best coaches have taken little bits from every coach they've ever seen. Um, but with this, what I like, what you like, what I really appreciate out of your program here is many of these, um, many of these small points that we take, I, I understand them now after my journey, right? Mm -hmm. So how can I take my coaches that are just coming in or my junior coaches, because we have our youth players mentor our, our youngest level players and, and let them benefit from my experiences without you know, degradating what they're going to build for themselves along their home journey. And so by creating some, some framework, some points of reference, it, it very quickly paints a picture for them and gives me some, you know, labels I can work with so that yeah. we can make sure we're player focused and not game focused. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, a, it's a great point. And um, it's how do you take people on the, on the journey with you? Because going all the way back to the first couple of slides, instruction's not going to work. You know, if you go and say to coaches, whether they're younger and they have their own ideals or they're older and they're stuck in their ways, you should play scoreboard soccer. You have to play scoreboard soccer. Oh, but I've got my own ideals and my own drills and it's tough. Now, I think a lot of you guys are technical directors at different clubs. So what I would say is this is my passion and I love doing this webinar. And if you want to get me on to other clubs, then um, by all means, contact me via Jordan and I'm here to spread the word. That's what I want to do. But the way I tackle that, Ryan, and I don't know if you, you have capacity to do this. I do this in person in, in Scotland. And when I go out and we've got 15, 16 coaches, they say to me, um, oh, yeah, we'll get the kids along. You know, we'll get the 10, 11, 12 year olds along and you can demonstrate it. And I say, no, no, no. The coaches are going to play, you know, because that's how you really, really see it. Um, and if you're able to, Ryan, to, to get your young coaches and your volunteers, get them in and play some scoreboard soccer. And hopefully they'll see that actually it's really, really hard work. You know, the football fitness you're getting is unbelievable. It's good fun. And you can say to them, right, guys, scoreboard soccer, play it for five minutes. Then say to no, right, no, you're on two touches. And then say, you know, how did that feel when I told you you had to play two touches? Well, it wasn't as fun for me. And I don't feel as if I can make the right decisions. Yeah, you know, you can uh, demonstrate it, I guess, is what I'm saying, Ryan, and show them the joys of playing the game. You, This is one of the best things about soccer, and scoreboard soccer is a really good example of it. It can be fun for kids, but it can make adults feel like kids again. See, when I go and do, you know, 30 and 40-year-old men and women, we do scoreboard soccer, and the scoreboard is a crossbar challenge. They absolutely love it. You know, they love it more than the kids. 
you know, a game of five sides and then trying to hit a scoreboard. So I'm not sure if that helps or not, Ryan, but, you know, two potential solutions. I would I would happily come and speak to anyone that you want to set me up to speak to and, and let them try it, let them play it as well. Because um, you, you might not dictate that they have to use it, but when you show them it, without you saying anything, they might, they might just take it, you know? Thanks for the nice feedback as well, Ryan. Uh, James? Yeah, and, and David, this is for both you and Jordan, and I really appreciate the session. I think, David, for maybe for your edification, one of the challenges I always see in Canada is there's not enough coaches that understand soccer. Mm -hmm. And so with what you're describing, it's actually quite applicable because you could have a, a, a large field where you're playing all these small-sided games, and there might be parents that have put their hand up to coach just because they want to help. And if you have a technical director who can go around and then instruct the coaches on, on the, the outcomes to praise and give points for, it allows parents that don't understand the game, I think, to more rapidly understand the game yeah. than sitting through sessions through soccer associations that are trying to grind out very, very technical concepts that they're just never going to grasp because they didn't play the game or they didn't have time to direct to learning it. So I actually find this very, very fascinating to apply on a large scale to help countries like Canada that don't have enough volunteers to, that understand soccer make quicker uh, development progress progress for the kids. Okay, and and, and actually, um, if we can get the volunteer moms and dads to understand, okay, you know nothing about soccer, that's a good thing. Because the people that think they know everything about soccer, sometimes that's the problem. And with kids, and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong here, guys. Maybe particularly in Canada, we don't need coaches. We need facilitators of football. You know, to go back to Nigel's point, you know, street football and playing the game and the game with the teacher's gone. So if we can get David's mum or dad to put their hand up and say, well, I'll be a facilitator of football. You're saying, great, bib them up and let them play. Oh, but what about if they don't listen to me or if they mess around? Well, here's the wee scoreboard game that you can do. And actually... If David's mum or dad happens to be a, a, a teacher or a firefighter or any walks of life, they might actually come up with some really, really good scoreboards. You know, really good scoreboards. I, I, I've had uh, teachers that the scoreboard has been a quiz on whatever they're working on in the classroom. You know, who was the Egyptian prince that got buried in the tomb of whatever? And they, they answer Tutankhamun and that's the scoreboard, you know? And um, so I, I really appreciate the feedback and, and actually, um, yeah, we, we need facilitators of football and maybe that's easier to get through mums and dads and someone who knows everything and or thinks that they know everything. So uh, I, I like the feedback that this could be a programme, you know, for them. You know, we're not asking you to be Pep Guardiola. We're asking you just to be there and let them play football. Well, and I, I always feel bad, David. My final point is when I'm coaching a session and and I look over and it's it's someone who's just a volunteer and they're mm. trying to coach something very technical and they've got the kids all stopped and they're not moving for 10 minutes. And he's just trying to instruct them through the outcome that he's really after where they yeah. could just be playing scoreboard soccer instead. And if mm -hmm. a technical director was at hand to, you know, help facilitate uh, it, it would be very, very powerful and keep the kids coming back as you say, because you just want it to be fun for them. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things, and guys, it sounds like we have a lot of technical directors from different clubs. So, you know, please get me on with your coaches, your parents, your volunteers, if, if that's something you want to do. Um, but, you know, one of the best things about a games-based approach, whether that's scoreboard soccer, 3v3, 4v4, just play the game, is you can always have it in your back, up, back pocket as a contingency plan. So actually for your volunteer mums and dads, if they see something on YouTube, or if a technical director gives them some ideas, they can try it. But if it doesn't work, they can jump into a game of football and let the game be the teacher. And that's probably how they're going to evolve their own knowledge anyway. Um, but I do that. You know, I, I, I've got a lot of confidence in coaching young players these days because I know I can try anything. And if it doesn't work, the kids aren't going to complain if we just go into 5v5. And that's what they need because of the demise of street football in this country. And it's probably about what you guys need because football is not as big in your culture as, you know, ice hockey and other sports. So, yeah, we can show our volunteer mums and dads this game, but we can also show them some stuff to try. But if it doesn't work, 
you know, bev them up and let them play. Thanks, guys. And any other questions or? I saw Tony had his hand up. I don't know if Tony's still uh, still here, still had a question, but I saw his hand. Went up. Um, it's not necessarily a question, David. By the way, I love your work. I've been following it for a while and I've been using it. Um, advice to everyone who is going to start using it, don't let the kids make it up the first session. <laughs> like, try, try and go through it a couple of times to give the kids some ideas. Otherwise, it ends up a little bit of a gong show. But um, no, it's... it's it's really good. Over here, clubs are supposed to be um, following certain standards with Canada Soccer Association. Mm -hmm. And at this age and stage, we should be running skill centres. Um, therefore, there should be less parent volunteers running this age and stage. So, but um, we def I know at my club, I I'm responsible for this area of the club. So we're mm -hmm. definitely being been using a lot of your a lot of right. your games within their uh, skill centers um, and 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 uh yeah it's just i can't speak highly enough about about what you've created it's a good it's a good little baby that you've created here so i love it uh, cheers cheers tony I, I appreciate that and um yeah engaging volunteers is one thing and tony makes a great point you know become familiar with the tried and tested scoreboard games connect for find the nemo it's all on the website. This webinar or a very similar recording of it is on my website if you ever need to revisit anything. Because I'm on a journey of scoreboard soccer now. We talk about child-centred coaching and it's their game and I'm just there to facilitate it. Most of my scoreboard soccer sessions, the kids show up, they set up the goals, they put out the cones, they pick the teams. If the teams are uneven or they're not enjoying it, they're, they're people, they're not players. You know, someone throws their hand up and says, guys, do you want to mix up the teams? And David and Tony swap bibs. And, you know, it's about giving them a, a voice, giving them autonomy. Um, Tony's a captain of one team. David's a captain of another team. Ten-year-old boys and girls. Tony can send players from my team to the scoreboard and I can send players from his team to the scoreboard. I think a good player development youth coach, your job is to make yourself obsolete. You don't need to be there. And if you can get to that level, then you're doing something right. And that's going to be probably a bit further down the line for, for quite a lot of the coaches that you're helping. But I'm really just there for safety. <laughs> you know, I'm there, I'm watching, and I'm, I'm enjoying watching them. But most of my players, I'm trying to bring back street football, but also street smart kids that can stand up for themselves, that can organise themselves, that can pick teams. And one of the nicest phone calls I ever got was the mum of a young player who thought he was rubbish at soccer. And the mum phoned and said, he's bouncing off the walls here. Because the best player said to him, oh, what a pass that was, go to the scoreboard. Imagine being 10 years old and one of your peers, one of the big characters in the group says to you, oh, what a pass, by the way, you go to the scoreboard. So I'm going beyond the level you guys are at. I've been doing this for six or seven years. But... OK, you might not have coaches, you might not have mums and dads, but you have kids and you have a pretty simple concept. So actually, if you can get the kids to design the scoreboards, run the session and send them to the scoreboards. I've got kids that one of them will still come along when she's injured and she'll be the coach. And I'm like, great, you know, sit and watch. But that's a that's a journey. But I'm really, really keen on player centred stuff because what we're. Okay, last little rant, and I'm sorry if I'm taking up too much of, of your time. We have a massive dropout rate in soccer in this country at 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. Teenagers drop out of sport in this country. And everybody thinks that you need to address it at those age groups. But really, if you make football insanely fun when they're 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, they're going to stay in the game. When they get to 14 and they start losing games 10 now, They'll have a bit of resilience and they won't give up football because that's the last option. I love this game. No matter what, I'm not giving up. If they move up to the under 15s and they hate the coach, they don't give up football. They join another team. But that only happens, guys, the job you're doing is you're keeping people in sport for a lifetime, a lifetime of physical and mental health benefits, a lifetime of making friends a lifetime of developing skills that are transferable to any workplace in the world. 
And if you get it right at the younger age groups, that's what you give them. So what we need to look like at the younger age groups is, okay, well, how do we make football really, really good fun? How do we make it really, really good fun? Now, fun today looks different to when I was younger. Because when I was younger, you, you could give me a game of hopscotch and I'd be fine, you know? You, you, you just fun today is different. What kids like is autonomy. They like to be owners of their own destiny. So let me tell you a quick, quick story. When I was younger, there was no autonomy in my house because there was four TV channels and somebody else chose what was on them. Mario and Luigi moved from left to right on the screen and not much else. You know, I couldn't phone my best friend if my mum was on the internet. So my house wasn't very fun, but the street was fun. We could talk about football, we could talk about friends, we could play games, we could take a break anytime we wanted, we could pick the teams, we could play Kirby, we could play hopscotch. That was that, right? But now the kids' autonomy, the fun is all in the house. You, you can moan about PlayStations, Xboxes, Fortnite, social media, Netflix, YouTube, TikTok. It's nothing to do with these. It's They all have one thing in common, autonomy. And these big businesses know it. Kids like to be owners of their own destiny. When they play a game now, it's not the, the person who owns the game that's named the character, designed the character, gave them a hairstyle, gave them a vehicle, and told them what world to live in. It's the kid gets to design all of that, you know? Um, social media, you can follow your favorite celebrity anytime you want. I would love to sit in the house and see what Zinedine Zidane was up to when I was younger, you know? Um, you can watch your favorite show anytime you want on YouTube and Netflix. And if you don't want to check in with your favorite celebrity, you can make yourself a celebrity. Give yourself a fancy name and an emoji and a background, create a TikTok, create a Snapchat. So guys, do you see what kids like? They like to be in control of their own destiny. That's the secret, that's the key. So if they come to your soccer practice and you take away all the autonomy, you must pass with inside your foot. You must play two touch, pass to Jordan and then run to the yellow cone. Go to the yellow cone and then stand in the line. Kids will keep coming for as long as mom and dad keep bringing them. But when they get to 14, 15, 16 and they have autonomy, they'll drop out of the sport because it's not actually been that fun. Not actually been that fun. And unfortunately in Scotland, and it sounds as if, you know, Tony's obviously, I'm assuming you're from here originally, Tony, um, where people find autonomy at 15 years old in Scotland is drink, drugs, vandalism, gangs. That's where they can finally be their own person. Sorry, that was a real rant on fun, but some of us maybe haven't thought about that. We always preach fun, but maybe some of us haven't thought, well, what is fun? Fun is autonomy. Giving the kids a voice, giving the kids choice, letting them make their own decisions, letting them play, letting them run around, letting them talk. That's fun for kids. Jordan, sorry, I went over time probably. I don't know if there was any, if I was just rambling there. Yeah, but I've got all afternoon booked off. I don't book anything <laughs> after these, uh, just in case. I, a thought came to my mind in terms of uh, when I look at what you're, you're developing and advocating, the thought of uh, kids compete and adults compare came yeah. to my mind. So my question is, how have you uh, really sold, for lack of a better word, sold the individualized nature of, of what scoreboard soccer is and the benefits of it in a team-based game that adults will compare that team result on a week to week basis. I mean, you touched on it. The first question out of the mouth was, did you win today? No. Nope. Did you score? No. Nope. Yeah. So that, that team-based performance is our bench line as adults and parents, I think typically to measure that performance. So um, how have you sold that individualized nature? Yeah. I think it just comes down to, to education and, and we're lucky in Scotland. I don't know if it's the same over there, with our system is set up that under eights, under tens, under twelves, we don't keep scores, we don't have league tables. They come in at like, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16. You get, you know, three points for a win. Mm. We, 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 we have trophy-free football with the youngest age groups. But a lot of parents haven't stopped to think about why. So it's just down to education when asked. 
say, well, actually, the re people, they all started playing games. They all hit puberty at different times. The reason for that is because at the younger age groups, it's individual development. That's why we don't keep scores or we don't have, you, you know, league tables or top goal scorers awards. Because if you're working at these age groups, your job is to make them all good footballers. It's individual development. And now that I have a bit of experience, I can say to them and see if you if you do go on that journey and you really, really focus on that, what an amazing feeling it is when at under 14, when there is a league table and there is a trophy, you have a load of technically proficient footballs. It's, it's the best thing in the world when you can go and work on playing out from the back, switch and play, high press and transitions, but all your players can play. You know, you're not going to have uh, technical breakdowns, um, but you will have technical breakdowns if the coach under eights was all about winning and not making them a load of good football. So I think when I talk and when I share some experience, I think you get the light bulb moments, but it's just about how do you spread that message wider that, you know, this is why the structure is the way it is because at the youngest age groups with individual development, the thing that helps you sometimes is most of the coaches you speak to at eights, nines, tens, elevens, they have a son or daughter in the team and they want to develop their son or daughter. So that can help as well. You know, don't worry about the scoreline at the weekend. Just try and make them all good, good players. Fair enough. Thanks, David. No worries. If there are any other questions, feel free to chuck them in the chat or uh, it's one of those speak now or forever hold your peace until you either hit up David on Twitter or email um, or through the website there. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it open for another a couple of minutes and see if anyone uh, has got anything to add or, or questions. Yeah. And guys, if you, if you are on social media and you have enjoyed the, the, the call tonight, um, please put on there, you know, hashtag scoreboard soccer so I can see it, but also to try and encourage other clubs. Cause this is what I try and do. My, my underlying motivation is to try and give young people a better experience than I had when I went to organize soccer, you know, it was standing behind the cone. It was running around the pitch. It was playing to touch. So if we have 10 coaches here, they go and do scoreboard soccer with 10 players. I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but, you know, if 100 kids have fun because of, you know, some of my ideas, that's my motivation. So please let me know. Uh, please help me spread the word. I would really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, with that, I'm going to, uh, to shut her down for today. Um, hopefully everyone's enjoyed their lunch uh, and, and enjoyed the chat with David. Um, I've got a sheet full of notes that I need to go back and reflect on and a recording to watch back again to, to process and, and think about it again. So thank you for providing that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to potentially the next one.